<clears throat> now here's a quotation from Shakespeare. It's Hamlet, Act One, Scene Three. Uh, in this scene, Polonius, uh, who is later going to be killed by Hamlet, but that has nothing to do with our story. But he's, he's sending his son overseas on a study trip, and uh, he is giving him fatherly advice, uh, which the young man will have to observe if he wants to succeed. And um, these three lines are very interesting. Neither a borrower nor a lender be. For a loan oft loses both itself and friend. And borrowing dulls the edge of husbandry. Very beautiful lines, but uh, today, to many, it sounds awfully outmoded. You know, who can live without credit? I mean, we all uh, uh, prosper because we have access to credit, buying uh, our homes, buying uh, consumer goods, buying it, especially a big ticket item like a car or <coughs> even a flat screen television. So, Shakespeare. What did he know about television? What did he know about that? But actually, I think it is sort of a very deep insight. Because what Polonius is telling his son uh, is not that you never borrow and never lend. That's not what he says. What he says is that borrowing and lending is an art. You've got to be an expert. Not just the banker who lands, but also if you borrow, that's fine as long as you know what you are doing. You, you have to be an artist to borrow. And then it's all right. And uh, it's, it, he doesn't say that uh, borrowing always dulls the edge of husbandry. No, because if you're an artist, then you can put it to the best use, and then you will prosper. And even more important than these considerations is the fact that in real bill circulation, there is simply no landing and no borrowing. I'm not suggesting that Shakespeare uh, anticipated Adam Smith and uh, all this, but I think there's a deep uh, wisdom in this that landing and borrowing is not the only source of credit. Watch out, there are other sources, in particular consumption. So I offer it to you for whatever it is worth uh, to consider this wisdom in Shakespeare, which personally I like very much. Hmm. So as a consequence, because credit arising out of consumption is very different from credit arising out of, uh, out of uh, savings, as a consequence, the uh, the rate of interest is going to be very, very different from the discount rate. So here is the discount rate, and here is the rate of interest. Normally, the interest rate is the higher of the two. I would say it's abnormal when there is a reversal, but there is occasionally, and that is always the sign of some kind of crisis. They call it uh, technical language uh, inversion of the yield curve. The yield curve is a curve showing uh, that as a function of uh, maturity, length of maturity, the percentage of the rate 
It's not a rule, a short term uh, loan commands a lower and long term loan or lending commands a higher one. But when the system is overextended, the yield curve could invert. So this is the normal yield curve. Starts from zero and it rises. So this is maturity, call it capital T for time, and this is percentage. And as you go out in time to maturity, maturity you have to, and that's that's of course uh, a consequence of the nature of business because. There are more risks involved if the maturity is extended. Less risk if it's shortened. So this is the normal thing. Now, what could happen is that the yield curve inverts, shoots up for short term and then it peters up. You know, and that's called the inverted yield curve. But that's always a red flag. That's always a dangerous signal showing damage. It's, and it's unnatural too, because how come that uh, for a longer maturity you pay a lower rate of interest? Well, the explanation is that there's such a tightness in the short term end of the market, of the spectrum, that it's very dangerous because you know there's a lot of toxic paper out there. <laughs> <laughs> and you won't land on short term unless the borrower takes on the risk in the form of higher interest. But that's abnormal. In any case, normally the interest rate is or must be higher than the discount rate. But other than that, both are free to move either the same direction or in the opposite direction because they are governed by completely different considerations. The propensity to save in the case of rate of interest, propensity <coughs> to consume in the case of the discount rate. So this is a very important consequence of our discussion. Now let's talk a little bit about the Achillean heel of quantity theory, quantity theory of money. I already talked about it, offered my criticism of the theory, and now I can be a little bit more specific, uh, pointing out to you what's really wrong with the quantity theory of money, and why, in fact, the quantity theory of money and the real bills doctrine of Adam Smith contradict one another. And the reason is that uh, when you are discounting real bills, then admittedly the, qu uh, the quantity of purchasing media has increased because that was just a great invention. Bills do circulate. So the more real bills are discounted, the greater the quantity of the purchasing media will be. So according to the quantity theory, money prices will shoot up because you have increased the quantity of purchasing media. 
But <laughs> that's just the wrong way to, to think about it. And why? Well, the reason is that, sure, the quantity of purchases in media increased by the amount of newly discounted real bills. However, however, just as these new real bills arise, so do the quantity of goods in the market. Because a real bill is discounted only if somebody wants to produce some goods that is in very high consumer demand. So the two rise and fall together. The quantity of purchasing media and the quantity of goods in high consumer demand will rise and fall together because uh, these uh, real bills will expire. <coughs> and they will expire just about the time when the maturing uh, semi-finished product become finished products and hit the market. They are in the hand of the retail merchant and the consumer has been waiting uh, for, the, uh, for them eagerly and will buy them. So at that time the consumer removes the good from the market. They are no longer offered in the market. But the bill will expire about the same time. So they also fall, to, not only they rise together, but they also fall together. So the quantity theory of money is not valid. If the real bill discounting follows the rules, which is that you've got to have a good in high consumer demand in order to discount it. And once that happens, the quantity theory is not predicting correctly uh, the price level. Now this is, uh, time flies, <laughs> um, there is the next excerpt from this uh, second greatest history, but starts bottom of page five, let me go through this as well. Uh, and and uh, I cannot skip this because this is very germane to our story. One day the weaver's loom broke down and upon examination he found that it was beyond repair. He couldn't make repairs. He needed a new one. And he needed it in a hurry because he had to produce the cloth for the, the cloth merchant was waiting for the cloth. So he had to buy a new loom and he didn't have the cash to pay for it. So he went to the loom maker and uh, found the loom he wanted and uh, bought no money, no deal. So he went to, uh, he had a pile of uh, maturing bills in his portfolio, so uh, the weaver went to the uh, cloth merchant and asked him to prepay his bill. And it just so happened that on that day, business was not very brisk and the cloth uh, merchant said, I'm sorry, I would love to help you, I know, I know you cannot produce cloth for me uh, without a new loom, but I just haven't got the gold what you uh, need to buy it. But then the cloth merchant, was, as I told you several times, a very smart man, is, he thought of something and he said, look, I give you a piece of advice. It might be worth more than gold. Take these bills, the pile of bills which the weaver offered to the cloth merchant, and go back to the loom maker. He may be interested to take these bills, see? 
In other words, the clock made a part of not just vertical circulation, but horizontal. Right. You might be lucky that Lumaker might have might want this extra income he will earn, the discount, the, is, is an income for the loom maker. So sure enough, the uh, weaver went to the loom maker and the loom maker was quite happy to take those maturing bills. He was looking forward to the extra uh, income in the form of discount and delivered the loom on the spot. You see? So this extended the scope of real girl circulation. Tremendously important uh, uh, development. <coughs> so to continue the story, next day as it happened, the uh, cloth merchant to uh, do that. However, I, <laughs> I just passed on those bills to the uh, bricklayer. I, I'm working on an extension of my loom factory and uh, I had to pay the bricklayer and uh, he uh, was happy to take those papers off my hand. So, go to the bricklayer. Perhaps he'll, you can make a deal with him. And this is what the <laughs> clockmaster said. To hell with it, I'm not going to chase my own papers. Uh, I, uh, I'm not going to go on a wild goose chase. Surely they will come back home to roost in their own good time. When the paper matures, they will come back. So I'm not going to chase him. I'm doing something more clever than that. And then, as we, as he was going home, still carrying this heavy bag of gold coins, he passed the mill 
the flour mill. I must see the miller. So, again, an example of a horizontal circulation. He went to see the miller and said, look, I've got this, this uh, pile of gold, and I would like to buy the paper you, ha you have drawn on the baker. And I offer you a good, good price. And the miller was very happy because he could use the gold. And the deal was done. You see? And this is another big step. Because the ex the scope for build trading has widened again. And he even quipped, he said jokingly, you know, I got tired of carrying my heavy cross of gold. <laughs> it's your turn now to take up the burden he said to the miller. <laughs> you see, this goes to show that it's not true that people by nature want to grab gold and hoard it. And... No, for some traders, especially those with insight who understand the nature of the market, nature of short-term credit, gold is a liability. You want to get rid of it. It's an old-fashioned mercantile theory that you want to have foreign trade export because you want gold and then keep the gold and hang on and don't let it go. Well, of course, there are extreme cases when it's, you are well advised to do that. But in normal course of business, this is the thing. If you are in trade and you, you're gold keeps piling up, you want to do something about it. You want to get rid of it. You will pick the best paper, best real build in the market and buy them, because this is an earning asset which still matures into gold. You see? So, I guess I, uh, this is a point where I would stop and then after 11 o'clock we'll continue with another lecture and uh, but if you have questions perhaps let's ask okay. it. I can. Uh, uh, yep, really. Uh, <coughs> Professor, you were more than kind uh, in your description of Lord of the State that we did such a good job. I don't think we did such a good job. I don't think I did a very good job because it was my excuse is that I was not really very well prepared. So I would appreciate another opportunity to refine this play, put a little more uh, subtlety, a little more stuff, something that we should do up there. I would like to, for example, play out a cash-only society. How every transaction needs to take place, how every player has to reach into his own pocket to pay the next one. And when, you, when the scenario came that the um, uh, the cloth merchant wanted to triple his business. If everyone had to reach into their pocket to do it, they would have to have three times as much gold sitting in their pocket. And that, that was made very clear. So, uh, you know, and in effect, if you're, if you're reaching into your pocket, you're having savings. What's in your pocket is a saving. And this comes from past performance. And if I go to the bank to borrow money to do this transaction to increase the stuff on my shelf, if, if I want to put three times as much cloth on my shelf, I have to have the cash for it, either from my pocket or somebody else's pocket. But with the real bill, I don't need to do that. No. I'm reaching into the future in anticipation of what will come 30, 60 days down the road and use that to uh, finance this whole deal. So, if it, you know, if we had an opportunity to do a little, to do this skit again, I'd like to improve myself and 
and go a little more subtlety and, and show some of the benefits. Because we kind of cut in the middle, credit was already there. <clears throat> so to, uh, to appreciate the credit, I like to play a scenario with no credit. Yeah. And then the credit comes. Yeah. And then, of course, it becomes uh, apotheosis of the credit is when it spreads up and does it all. Okay, well, not today. That's but what we're going to do. What about tomorrow? Well, maybe when I have my talk. Oh, uh, yeah, okay. I, I, when I, I, you have your talk, I would like to that you uh, fit it in somehow. Either, That's either right. we, we can go with the guys, so it's not necessary. No, I can just say it. This is okay. Reason, this is possible. Thank you. That would be a very good thing to do. Yes? I have a question that will be a little bit more abstract. Based on a uh, previous discussion with you about the discount rate, that there's only one discount rate which applies across the whole market. But I, I keep thinking, we say that cloth will fly and bricks will not fly. But is there not a continuum with bread being probably the highest? Because everybody has to eat every day to maybe uh, restaurant food, to clothing, to iPods. You know, and, and some, and so is there a, a spread between the published discount rate and each, each kind of bill does it have a spread off of the, the general discount rate, or how does that work? Mm. Well, brick is not a good example because bricks don't fly. However, bread does. So <laughs> a better example is comparing the uh, travel of cotton to the market and the travel of wheat to the market. So if there was a different discount rate in this river from that river, then there will be arbitrage. You see, the discount house is a later development, but let's assume that the cloth merchant gave up his business and he started the first discount house ever in history. And then uh, this former cloth merchant would see that difference in the discount rates, right? And uh, you understand that a higher discount rate means a lower price for the bill and vice versa. And this is the seesaw. Okay. So he wants to take advantage of this discrepancy of the difference in uh, the discount rates. And he will buy the cheaper real bill and sell simultaneously the more expensive one. Now he might have to, let's assume for the sake of argument, the discount rate is higher in the cotton chain and lower in the grain chain. Now, since the discount rate is higher there, these, these are the cheaper ones. So what will uh, the guy do, the discount house manager do? He will buy the cheaper one, okay? So he will go to the weaver or whoever has uh, these bills waiting for maturity and offers to discount. My question is slightly different from that. Again, obviously, if there's this price in then arbitrage will correct the mispricing. Yeah. But you said that, and this makes sense to me, that the discount rate is a function of propensity to consume. What if there literally is a greater propensity to consume bread at this moment than cloth? Would it not be appropriate for bread to have a lower discount rate if the propensity to consume bread was higher? Well, fine. Uh, uh, so it's a question whether the two discount rates will equalize on their own, or it will take arbitrage on the part of the discount house manager. Why you know, I mean, the discrepancy could be eliminated for several different reasons. But why would the discount house want to buy the bill of something that has a lower propensity to consume, and sell the bill of something with a higher propensity to consume? No, no, that's not the reason he buys. He buys because of the discrepancy in the, in the price of the bills. There are bills floating around in this chain, bills floating around in that chain. 
And uh, in terms of this country, you can decide which one is cheaper. But if there's, if there's a lower propensity to consume class, then there's a greater risk that that class will not sell through. But that, uh, that immediately shows up in the discount rate, you see? So in other words, uh, uh, there is a natural adjustment and there is, let's call it, artificial adjustment. The natural adjustment is almost instantaneous. If there is a real uh, uh, increase in propensity to consume bread, that will immediately show up in the discount rate. So uh, there is a lag here. The discount uh, house manager, what he sees is already after the, there was a natural adjustment. Right. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, what we do here is we oversimplify, but every theory is an oversimplification. And uh, we just assume that the, uh, what the discount house manager sees is after all the natural adjustments which have taken place already. Right. And then he takes this as his data and acts. Does the arbitrage, or if there's not big enough difference, then he stays away, okay? So I guess my question is, if, if the propensity to consume cloth was decreasing, let's say it's March and people are not buying so much clothing because it's, you know, heading into summer, would, would those bills become less liquid because any, any cloth that's still left over in March may, may have a high risk that it won't sell until next year? Yeah. Now, uh, you see, uh, you, you are assuming that uh, the propensity to consume uh, could deviate ve very greatly from one market right. and another. Uh, but in effect, this is not what happens in reality, because if the propensity to consume increases, this means that the consumer has more spare cash. and then the consumer will have to decide how to spend it. And if given a normal situation, statistically, it's reasonable to assume that some consumers will buy more uh, cloth and some will buy more bread. But it's unreasonable to, uh, to expect that uh, all the consumers will spend their spare cash on bread because they can only eat so much. And they need, need only so much cloth to get summer. In other words, uh, the, the uh, propensity to consume is spread more or less evenly. I mean, can you think of a, a real reason why somebody would buy twice or three times as much bread? No, no, what I'm thinking is, let's say the propensity to consume is at a certain level. Okay. And the propensity to consume decreases. The My theory is it would not decrease as much for bread as it would for cloth. Bread would still hold. It's cloth that would absorb the decrease. That's in possible. That's you possible. have to eat, but you don't have to buy your clothing. That's possible. So that happens, if this declines, if this does not, then does this not deserve Well, higher still, uh, it cannot be arbitrarily large. No, but, but, but a spread. Well, there is a spread. And, and that, uh, I think it will be taken care of in normal course of business. I, I don't see this as a, a great uh, problem or uh, reason to dis discount this theory. Well, uh, you, you might make improvements. Yeah, I'm only just thinking that the, the improvement of the theory is that maybe you might have a slight spread for each kind of bill. So there's one discount rate, and then there's a spread uh, from, from bit for, for, for bread, there's a spread for cloth, there's a spread for... Um, no, but these are all shoot. small, and remember, this is not right. a static picture. This is a dynamic picture. So it's changing from day to day. And these small spreads could even out. Uh, I, I, guess, I guess the answer around the question what would happen is if the propensity to consume cloth increased, 
then the marginal uh, cloth merchant would stop buying cloth. And so there would be fewer bills in the cloth market. Okay, so, so there's a thread, there's a thread that tend to pull back up to wherever the. Okay, but now it's like. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll come back in 15 yeah. minutes uh, for, the, for the second lecture, okay? 15 minutes.